Meanwhile, on the comic box. <laughs> Geeks around the world prepare for Comic-Con. You get an extra chance to watch the killing joke on the big screen. And hey, wife. Comics. That was a long one. Hey everyone, welcome to the Comic Box, part of the geek to geek Podcast Network. I am Rob, your friendly neighborhood comic geek, and full disclosure, I am recording this as San Diego Comic-Con is happening. I'm recording this on Saturday morning because uh, I got to it late this week. But I want to do an all-Comic-Con episode or a special episode, and I'm going to try and see if maybe I can get Liam back to do that with me so I have someone to bounce that off with. So for now, for this episode, I am just going to be covering everything leading up to Comic-Con, and then I'll do a full big Comic-Con wrap later. So, news. Riri Williams, the new Iron Man, or one of the new Iron Men because the other is Doctor Doom. Marvel has released what both armors are going to look like, uh, but specifically to the Williams armor, I think it's a pretty good move in that it's not feminine. So for people saying, Iron, how can it be Iron Man because it's a woman, whatever, this is probably what they were talking about. So it could be that it's going to be like when Tony Stark was first Iron Man, and so it was an identity that needed to be kept secret. It makes sense then if you are a female and you want to keep a secret identity and you're wearing a big suit of armor, you don't make that armor clearly be for a woman, clearly female. You don't have the body shape in the armor of the person wearing the armor because that's not how armor really works anyway. So therefore, it could easily be a woman in the Iron Man armor if the armor itself appears more uh, masculine than feminine. I think that's cool. I think that was a good move. So link to that in the show notes and then link to the Doctor Doom armor as well, which is basically just a all silver with some highlights of green in it kind of thing. And then, of course, looks like it has the Doctor Doom cape and that sort of thing. But links to those in the show notes. On that note, if you're interested in learning more about Riri Williams and haven't read any of those comics, Marvel immediately hopped on the bandwagon as soon as the announcement went out and it became, you know, sort of a controversy and very popular and talked about on national news and stuff that... They are reprinting or have reprinted all previous Iron Man issues with the character, except now on the cover, there's a little bug, a little circular thing that says featuring Riri Williams. So if you're interested to go back and read about the character, those individual issues are going to be out. Otherwise, I'm sure, you know, the trade that'll wrap up this arc before they relaunch with her as the lead. Moving over to DC, and this should have been first, but moving over to DC, The Killing Joke is going to be in theaters for an extra day. And this is important because I'm recording this on Saturday. I'm hoping to put this out today on Saturday. And this is happening in two days on Monday is when they are doing the Fathom Events screening of The Killing Joke in major theaters. And then they added 300 theaters. Now they've added Tuesday showing. So if you can't get to it on Monday, you can get to it on Tuesday. Keep in mind that it is more expensive. I think my local theater tickets were like 13 bucks and change. But if this is a thing that you don't want to wait for in digital, you don't want to wait for on a DVD or Blu-ray, and you want to go see it in the big screen, pause this podcast, go to the show notes. I have a link there for you. Go and pick up your tickets right now. I can't say that they're going to sell out, but there's a reason they had to add additional theaters and then a second day. People want to go see this in the theater. So if you're one of them, pause, go and do that. I'll be here when you come back. While we're talking Killing Joke, they are getting a soundtrack release. So if you go online, you can find the list of tracks. Really, they're just describing the situations. You know, it's not like they have, uh, from what I could tell, actual recording artists recording music. It's just, it's the score, rather, for the thing. So... If you go see The Killing Joke in the theater or I, I thought it was on Tuesday or maybe it's Wednesday or something that they release it digitally. But if you see The Killing Joke and you thought the music was awesome, it's getting its own soundtrack, which is pretty cool. Hey, kids, do you like The Lost Boys? I kind of don't, but it's getting a sequel in comic book form from DC. I was never I'm a big vampire fan. I was never a huge fan of The Lost Boys, though. I don't know if it was because it was Joel Schumacher and he put glitter in the blood so that it would shine more. But I know a lot of folks are big fans, though didn't they do? I want to say Lost Boys got like a sequel. 
it might like a direct to DVD or direct to video, I suppose, at the time sequel at some point. Uh, I don't think it actually had to do with any of the original characters, though, which this does. My understanding is this is following the story of the original characters from the first film. Staying on topic there, Dark Horse has announced that Buffy is coming back for an 11th season in comic book form. So the comic started from season 8, the show ran for 7 seasons, picked up in season 8 in comic book form, and it's been going strong ever since. So no surprise there, I'm sure they get decent sales. Personally, I think I might switch over and just start picking up trades. This last season was pretty slow. And Buffy is one of the few comic books that every month I go to my comic shop and buy in regular comic book form rather than in trade form or digital. So I don't know. Hey, if anybody out there wants to buy every issue of Buffy from season eight through the end of season 11, let me know because I just might go and sell it off and then try and turn it all over into trades, depending on if I can find the trades cheap enough and get enough money for, for my comics run. Switching gears, if you're a fan of adult coloring books, Marvel is releasing three more. They're releasing a Deadpool, a Wolverine, and then a Guardians of the Galaxy adult coloring book. I haven't done any of that myself. I know my wife's done a little bit. I have some friends. My buddy Paul is big into the adult coloring books. I remember doing it as a kid where I would print out pages and color them. DC, I don't know if they still do, but their website used to actually have coloring pages that you could print off, and I would do that color them in, and then I would cut them out and tape them to my long boxes to decorate them so I knew what was in each box. So, like, I would print out and color a picture of Green Lantern to put in my Green Lantern box, that sort of thing. Stan Lee, Stan the Man Lee, is at it again trying to create his own comic books. This time, he has created a superhero named Nitron, and apparently he has a budget behind him, and he's looking to turn it into film, television, digital... I don't really have any other details beyond that, but considering the amazing success that wasn't Stripperella that he did with uh, Pamela Anderson Lee, uh, you know, I can't say I'm going to expect a whole lot out of this. It seems like he has these ideas, but he's not starting from where he did, which is, you know, Spider-Man, here's a character we can all relate to. And from there, it builds popularity. It looks like he's just trying to say, I'm Stan, I'm Stan Lee, you know, and launching a thing. Uh, into film and television and digital works. The guy is 93. He can do what he, and he's Stan Lee, so he can do whatever he wants. I'm proud of the guy for still creating this far out. I personally don't see it as a thing that's going to be amazingly successful, but you know, if it is, good for him. Lastly, in our news for this week, if you are a Pokemon Go fan, Valiant Entertainment, who also puts out the Valiant line of comics, books that contain, and I don't care about the others, the only one I love is Quantum and Woody, which they don't actually have a series of right now, which is insane! But they are partnering with American comic book stores here in the United States. America, it's not a brand, just comic books in the U.S. It, to do a Pokemon Go sponsor thing where they sponsor Pokestops at local comic book stores. I, that's probably more of Beach and Void's territory since it's Pokemon Go and its games, but it has to do with comics in a way to bring people into comic books and into comic book stores. When I go into my comic store, I don't like it being crowded. I think that takes away part of the charm of being able to go to a place where there's just a couple people in there and you're all really dedicated, you know, comic book guys. For a bunch of people just to be standing around blocking the already small aisles, you know, staring at their phones playing Pokemon uh, would, you know, suck. But hey, kids, if you like Pokemon Go and you like comic books, then your local comic book store may soon become a Pokestop, which is very cool. And that is it for news. Reviews for this week. We start with Buffy Season 10, number 29, the penultimate issue of the season, meaning we only have one issue left to go. Buffy and the Scoobies uh, finally face down with Dehoffrin and his vengeance demons. Uh, Dehoffrin has stolen the vampire, or vampire, the vampire book in order to rewrite the rules of magic. As a vengeance demon, you're basically genie from Aladdin, where you have phenomenal cosmic power, but you can only change reality or change things if somebody else wishes it. This does not make Dehoffrin happy, so he's going to try and change the laws of magic in order to allow vengeance demons to change things when they want to. 
Buffy has found a way to keep him from writing in the book, which leads up to this conflict. So the issue shows him and his vengeance demons, which include a copy of Anya. It's not the real Anya. She is dead. So this is a different Anya, a copy that de Hoffren has made. And Jonathan, who, hooray for the return of Jonathan, but he has been called forth as a vengeance demon by de Hoffren as well. So they go head to head with the Scoobies. And I'm going to throw out the spoiler for the issue here. So they tend to kill somebody at the end of each season, even though they then often bring them back. So skip ahead by a few seconds. Skip, skip, skip. So spoilers, three, two, one. Looks like we might lose Xander, which sucks. My favorite character, but it looks like the the fake Anya has, as she puts it, turned him into a ghost. So we see a pile of ash, whatever. So we'll see how that plays out. I'm kind of, I don't really get shocked by this anymore. I think, you know, originally in the earlier continuation seasons, you're like, oh no, I love that character. That's so sad. But now it's sort of like, you know, they're into comic books now. So everybody tends to keep getting, you know, brought back. Even if it's like Giles getting brought back as a a teenager or preteen, you know, that 12, 13 year old sort of range. I don't know. I kind of thought I would take it as a bigger shock, but maybe it's just because this season has been going on so long and it doesn't really come as this big, oh no, we lost another character because it's not being played the way it was when, say, Buffy's mom was killed in the show and it was this huge deal or, or when you know, when Buffy died in the show and it became this, even though, you know, she was coming back because the show was called Buffy. But that sort of thing where they really deal with the fallout and it feels like an impact where here it's like oh okay so another character is gone and we'll probably come back you know immediately at the start of the the next season moving over to green lanterns number three i will say immediately within the first couple pages of this book i was put off by the shift in artists also the whole like plot line they're doing this red dawn thing where it's atrocitus leader of the Red Lanterns, who are the Angry Lanterns. They're the Rage Lanterns. We'll call them the Angry Lanterns. Uh, Where their whole plot is, we have a tower and it burrows into the earth and then turns the earth into an evil earth. The new home of the, you know, Red Lanterns. It feels very, I guess the term is comic booky, but for me, I want to say it feels like an episode of a kid's cartoon from like the 80s, early 90s, where it's this very, very much, you know, super villainy plot to do this thing And they're not really focusing on the reasons why, which we got introduced to, which is that Red Lanterns are dying off because they don't have a current source for their Lantern core, for their power, for their rage or whatever. And, you know, I think that would make a better storyline focusing more on why they're doing it, because then it makes them a little more relatable instead of we are evil doing evil things to continue being evil. You know, and there's this whole subtext where, like, the point of saying that humanity has so much rage in it that they would attract the Red Lanterns and it would become a great planet to headquarter the Red Lanterns because of the rage inherent in humanity. Like, that could be a really powerful thing you could have in the book, just not the way that it's being dealt with right now. I'm not saying it needs to be dealt with a heavy hand and really shoved in your face, but they could do it a little more head on than they are currently like that would be this really good sort of subplot to the main uh what i feel is the plot of the book that i enjoy which is the interaction between the two green lanterns jessica cruz and simon baz i i enjoy the way that they're you know mutual rookies so they're always arguing about the right way to do the job really makes for a good read um also i don't simon baz the magic lantern that's what I'm calling him from now on, because he, he he again uses his ring to heal someone. This time he temporarily heals the Red Lantern bleeds of being a Red Lantern, where she becomes her former self before she turned into this a giant rage monster. And it was odd to see that now Simon Baz can do that. I mean, we already have Kyle Rayner out there who's a White Lantern who can heal folks. So I just if if the whole new thing is that they're space cops, make him space cops. And every space cop doesn't, they can be individual and they can each have a cool thing about them. But I feel like Simon Baz, who can now just magically heal people with his ring versus previous lanterns who were doctors and actually had to create medical things out of their rings in order to heal people, you know, and then now he also has those visions as well, the emerald sight or whatever. So I don't know. I feel like they're giving Simon Baz too much. Just make him the other rookie, make him the hothead so that he can, you know, be on the other side of the coin from Jessica Cruz and do it that way. 
Uh, other thing I read was a suggestion from Void. I read the first volume. I got my hands on the first volume of Wayward. Uh, the story is a Japanese-Irish girl who moves to Japan, and so it's her first time in Japan from moving from Ireland to live with her mom. And she runs into a bunch of different evil spirits, learns that she has powers, runs into others with powers. It really has the feel sort of an, of an anime or an anime-style cartoon, both in art style and in the story. It is sort of an origin story, but then also doesn't give a lot of the background, so there's still mystery there. So I can see why Void likes it. I personally would have preferred more exposition, but you do sort of get that at the end of the trade where they break down what each of these different types of Japanese spirits are. So I'm assuming that must be more common knowledge for people so they can read the comic and say, oh, this is an interpretation of this sort of thing. But I am... Not a person who is as entrenched in Japanese culture. I've never really been an anime fan, so I don't... A lot of that is new to me. So I liked having that reference in the back, but I didn't know it was there until I, I got... I started at the beginning, sat down and started reading, so I didn't flip through to see that, oh, at the end it actually explains what these things are that they're running into. It was an okay read. I'm sure fans of that type of storytelling and fans of anime and such and Japanese culture will definitely enjoy the book. I don't think it's going to be one that I'm going to buy and, and put on my shelf. But I appreciate the suggestion. Also, I had another suggested read by Chris Fruin via Twitter who suggested Planetary. And I did not get my hands on Planetary this week, but I did go back and for the first time in I don't know how long, I reread my Planetary JLA graphic novel, which is written by Warren Ellis, the guy who writes Planetary. So this is an Elseworld story. And it's basically saying what would happen in the DC universe if planetary existed, this sort of shadow government of a handful of people that control what new technology shows up and that sort of thing. So in this Elseworlds sort of universe, the planetary group got their hands on the Kryptonian shuttle that sent Superman to Earth and used that to develop technology, which then they hoard for themselves and decide who gets and, and sort of rule the world via that. So the story itself follows Clark Kent, Diana Prince, and Bruce Wayne, who are not Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. Clark Kent is still has those powers and, and all that, but um, in this world, there are no superheroes. So it's these three characters as they get together and attempt to take down Planetary. And um, it's a better read than I remember it being. I actually really liked it. It felt very short. Like, it was very kind of a short and sweet story. But I, in particular, I really liked the thought that Batman, instead of spending his life training to fight general criminals, because it was general criminals that killed his folks, in this one he blames Planetary. So he spends 20 years just training himself to take down Planetary. So it almost has that Grant Morrison sort of feel where it's like, I've been preparing for this moment for 20 years. You're screwed. And it's very kind of, cool and powerful. And then I really like the, the art as well. That's by Jerry Ordway. So if you can get your hands on that, if you're a Planetary fan, I would suggest reading it. I'd, and I'd like to hear your take if you thought it didn't do justice to normal Planetary. Otherwise, that is still on my list. I'd like to get my hands on it uh, one of these days down the road. I just didn't manage to get to it this week. But thank you again for that suggestion. All right, uh, onto the polis in the archives. Actually, I'm going to start since I just finished talking about books that I had just read. Uh, I'm going to talk about podcasts that I've been listening to. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all the people on Twitter. Like immediately, I got a whole bunch of podcast suggestions. I had asked for other comic book podcasts for myself to listen to, both to help me improve my show and uh, maybe get a hold of some people to come on as a guest host. They can plug their show. We can talk about you know, their take on comic books and how they like to talk about comics. And I just thought that'd be interesting for you guys to listen to, sort of you know, smash together some of your favorite podcasts because uh, I'm just going to assume that I'm one of your favorite podcasts. Why wouldn't I be? I mean, listen. Listen to my soft voice. Yeah. Anyway, um, that was weird. So uh, the podcasts that I've managed to get to so far are the Fantastic Cast, which is uh, two guys overseas, and they are near London, 
They don't live in London, was my understanding from the episode I listened to. And all they do is talk about the Fantastic Four. So they go through every comic book appearance of them. So I think they were talking about a comic from the 60s, um, early 60s, for the episode that I listened to, which is totally cool. Like, what a neat, very unique thing. And I know that there's several out there. Like, we are just going to go through every issue of this book. And I love that idea. So I listened to the Fantastic Cast, Snake Oil Comics, and the Comic Conspiracy. And then I've just started listening to the most recent episode of the Geek 101 podcast. And then still on the docket that I've downloaded are the most recent episodes of the Legion of Substitute Podcasters and the Black Girl Nerds podcast. So I've enjoyed everything so far. I look forward to listening to the other ones. So big thanks to Void, who made the suggestion of the Geek 101 podcast. And then uh, the Twitter users, Devin, Big Dev, F, Jaron Merchant. Cash Flag and Travis McIntyre for their suggestions of these other comic podcasts. If there are more out there, if you guys have suggestions, comic book podcasts you really like, people you think I'd get along with, if, you know, pull one or two of them onto my podcast for a week, let me know. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, contact info in the show notes. Otherwise, I will uh, let you know at the end of the podcast. All right. So the poll list. Next week, I'm looking forward to Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps number one. See where that book is going. I might pick up Harley Quinn 30. I'm kind of petered out on Harley Quinn, so we'll see. Wonder Woman 3. Uh, Civil War 2 number 4, I'm not going to buy. But the spoilers are always online, like the day it comes out. So I'll be sure to include that, if not in my reviews, then in my news section. And then Mighty Thor number 9. As far as the archives go this week... The book I want to suggest to you this week is actually a book, but stick with me here. I don't know if it's available in softcover. It is the 2015 book, Amazing, Fan Amazing, Fantastic, Incredible, a Marvelous Memoir by Stan Lee and Peter David with art by Colleen Duran. So simply put, this is Stan Lee telling his life story in comic book form. So while it's technically a book, it is also very much a graphic novel. Uh, so it has... Very happy moments, obviously. It also has some really sad moments because it's his life story. And I love the way that they illustrated it. I think Colleen Duran did a really good job. Love the way that the book shows other comic book artists. Like Jack Kirby, for example. It, he's always smoking a cigar, but he has Kirby dots coming out of his cigar along with the smoke. So I like the way that they add those little touches for each of these artists. So it was just a fun read, even though you can totally tell that Stanley. He's telling it from his point of view, so he's never wrong in any of the disagreements he gets into with other people. But that's, it's a memoir, so it's not somebody else writing a biography of him, so of course there's going to be some of that there. But it is, it's a solid read. I really, I enjoyed it. So, amazing, fantastic, incredible, a marvelous memoir by Stan Lee. Go check it out. Topic of the week. All right. <laughs> So uh, the topic of the week this week is my wife, I guess, or her opinions. I have... You're shopping me around? No, no, <laughs> nothing like that. So my wife is here. We're going to call her wife. And I just like the idea. We've been talking about doing a podcast ourselves for a while. Um, that was just sort of like a geek and wife thing where you would ask questions about mm -hmm. particularly geeky topics that you didn't know enough about. And then I got insanely busy doing my own hobbies and yeah. forgot about yours. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine, which which works. I, um, but now I got you here. Mm -hmm. You had the free time. so No, you promised me dessert after this. <laughs> You've held me hostage for dessert. <laughs> you had the free time. But I just thought it was a cool idea to have a conversation with, you know, somebody who doesn't like comics but still has to have, I don't know, I guess one foot in the hobby. Mm -hmm. No, you said conversation. So does that mean I get to talk during this? <clears throat> it does. Unlike our usual <laughs> conversations. It does not. <laughs> uh, uh, so I don't know. I'm trying to think what the best way of starting that off is. Would it simply be like, what are your geeky credentials then? Like, so what, because I know there's a couple things that you're a big fan of as far as geekdom. So what would you say is your geek cred? Probably more real science, like the stuff that you learn in school and the stuff that's educational, not necessarily a fictional 
geeky thing that's not necessarily my thing. I more geek out on weather and, and that sort of stuff I can learn practical things from. But you still have geeky things you're into. Like, because I know you're... I guess. Because you're a Buffy fan. I am a Buffy fan. And you're a Big Bang. You're a big, big, big bang. You enjoyed the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> but is that really a geeky thing? Because you're mostly watching it for the character interactions and the jokes. And you know there's nerdery in there, but I don't understand most of it. And when they talk physics and stuff, I don't get any of that. Right. And then when they talk comics, I only know it's a comic reference because you look over and you're like, that's a comic reference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, and then, or, that's what I sound like when I... When pretty I, much. Yeah. Or you look over and you're like, that's not how it goes. That's... that's Whatever, whatever the one thing that they do, like, that's not accurate. He actually did blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no one cares. <laughs> oh, I, I remember the one particular instance where they talked about Jason Todd taking over as Batman. And it is. It's a ridiculous statement. Oh. And it was in, like, the first or second episode. Absolutely. Blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is it like to be married to a comic geek? Somebody that's always trying to get you to read a comic or take you to a comic movie but you're not trying to get me to read a comic anymore you suggested it a bunch in the beginning and i tried one and i didn't and really lumberjanes oh, tried lumberjanes and i didn't really like it i think because i don't know the picture and word bubble structure while it makes sense it just doesn't flow in my head you know, whereas if you're reading an actual book, it's he said this, he is thinking this. They then went and walked over here and you get this, you know, Harry Potter. Um, so I guess those are some of my geek creds, Harry Potter. You get this whole world laid out for you and you get to imagine what it's like. And you are described the distance between one place and another instead of just seeing two frames where now they're in the woods and now they're at a building. Well, I don't know if that was a long journey in that building or if it was in the middle of the woods. Who knows? Like, I, I, I really like a bit more, the th- things a bit more spelled out for me. As nice as it is to see some pictures so that I can get somebody's face into my head, I really like more novel format for my stories. Versus having to take individual pictures and then putting the sequence together in your head right or kind of thing like you'd right. rather watch the movie than look at the storyboards exactly exactly I, while i can appreciate them and find them interesting and unique and neat they just don't speak to me personally okay that being said then what do you think of the wider comic book sort of world now that it's branched out into other media because I've, you and I have gone to, I believe, or we didn't go out to see all of them, but we've seen every Marvel film. I think. Because you saw, we saw Civil War, mm-hmm. and we did Ant-Man, and then we did, I know we did the Avengers, and, and so I think we have seen all of the Marvel movies, but then... I never saw the Hulk. That's fair. Okay. So there's a couple, I, I've seen the major ones. I think that's the only one maybe we haven't. Maybe. Because out of the rest of them. So... Not being really a fan of comic books then in general, how do you feel about the movies? I think they're fine if they're a good story. Ant-Man's not a good story. Okay. But... Well, wait, wait, no, wait, why, why was Ant-Man not a... It was basically the same story as Iron Man. No. Where it's somebody else had the same technology except they were evil. And then you had to beat them with worse technology, basically. Uh, that's fine, but the story wasn't told very well. It was just very transparent. You could see where it was going, you know, and, and they try and put Paul Rudd in there for humor. Ha ha. And I love Paul Rudd. I don't think that what they wrote for him was very great. Because, like, he was fine in, as, like, a bit role in Civil War, but it was a small piece of a larger thing. Which... So you were okay with him as, as being in Civil War of, oh, wow, you're Captain America. and Yeah, as, as a bit role or as part of an ensemble, but Paul Rudd for two hours as Ant-Man was just... Didn't do it for you. Didn't do it for me. And I don't think it did it for most people. Let's be real. Still better than Hawkeye, though. For Hawkeye sucks. <laughs> you just wanted me to say Hawkeye I sucks. I do, because that's your whole thing, is every time we see a Marvel movie. That was actually is... the first comic you 
tried to get me to read. Oh, you're... was the Matt Frack? Was the where he's just wearing the T-shirt? The, it's the I have no idea. Okay, but I was like, okay, give me give me a comic. I will. I broke down. I had a soft spot somewhere one day, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. all right, what comic do you think I should read? And you're like, well, you're not gonna like it, but. Hawkeye. There's Hawkeye. <laughs> I was like, nope, nope. <laughs> Hawkeye sucks. Can't do it. Yeah, I think it was just because I, I did. I really liked the comic. And it's usually whatever I'm reading at that time. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I, I need, I can't do stressful stories. You and I have, have tried to do some of that before watching movies and watching series. Like I got through, what, like a season and a half of Breaking Bad and it was just, it was just too stressful for the payoff of a good story and so which is why you suggested you know hawkeye and then you went to the comic store and somebody suggested lumberjanes and it was Mm -hmm. fine it was a nice upbeat story it was just not my format but as far as the movies are concerned as long as it's a good story like iron man was a good story it was told very well it doesn't so much matter to me what the characters are because they all fall under the same archetypes the problem that i have with the comic movies is that it, I feel like everybody's so focused on them at the expense of other good stories. Because you look out there right now, what's out there? There's a bunch of comic stories, and then there's a bunch of there's a bunch of crap. And there's there's Oscar bait too, but it's it's mostly the fun stories that are meant for date nights are now either so lowbrow where you just are not into it, or they're comic movies. And some of the comic movies, especially the in-between ones, aren't done as well, like Ant-Man. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's only at the expense of other stories is where I'm, I'm a little bit burned out a bit on the comic stuff. The comic movie fatigue thing that a little people bit. are starting to talk about. But then again, you've also told me that a bunch of movies that I've seen have actually been based off of comics. So it's the fact that they're focusing on the superhero aspect. Like you told me, what, Road to Perdition Mm -hmm. and Men in Black, Mm -hmm. which are not, you know, your capes and superhero movies. Those are based on comics. So clearly there are other comics other than people in underwear and capes that you could take. Yes. So focus on on those. If you're going to take a bunch of comic movies or a bunch of comics and make them into movies or shows like The Walking Dead, make them not Batman and not these established characters that everybody knows. Find something obscure. People loved Men in Black. Go find another Men in Black. Yeah, yeah. That said then, if it's just not your medium, then what would it take, do you think, to turn someone like yourself, who's not really a comic fan and just doesn't really dig into the format of comics... To become a comic book fan. And before before you answer, just as an example, is there's digital comics now where they actually go through and it's, here's the picture, you swipe to one side, here's the word bubble. Like, you don't just look at a page, you can read it on your phone or on a tablet and it will take you panel by panel, introduce the characters, and then introduce what they're saying. So it actually kind of takes you by the hand and shows you how to read a comic. I think... It might take a combination of something like that, but not necessarily where it's a picture and then there's the word bubble and then there's a picture and you keep swiping, whatever. It might be more of a novel format with pictures intertwined in there or interspersed. And then, you know, the next iteration of that book has more pictures, fewer texts or less text. And you're progressively moving to that. And it might ease you in to the comic, the true comic format, but just going from a novel or whatever to a comic book to, in my head, they're so very different that I need to sort of wade my way into the shallow end before I go to learn to use the diving board. That, and it's got to be a good story. It can't be terrible. And I think part of it is just being at the right place at the right time in your life to read comics, if that makes any sense. Think about it like when you're trying beer, when you're trying, you know, beer as a younger person, it is disgusting. Like your parent, you're like, oh, dad's having a beer. Can I have a sip? And your dad's like, sure, just to show you that you're going to hate it. So you take a taste of it and you hate it. It's disgusting. And you don't 
want it for a really long time. But then as you grow up and your tastes evolve and your palate changes, you can warm up to it and you can get to a point where you're like, I actually really like beer. I think it's the same thing. I I feel like a person has to be ready to fully absorb that kind of medium and appreciate it for what it is. I'm not going to be one who goes to an art show and can say, oh my gosh, there's so much emotion in these scribbles of color. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm never going, but if I if I started with more realistic art and then gradually made myself go to something else, you know, you can sort of learn to appreciate small steps at a time. Or maybe one day I just want to go and see that. I don't know. I, I feel like I have to be in the right frame of mind. Since you started as a kid, you've sort of grown up with that. And so that is now a normal way to absorb a story to you. It's not to me. Gotcha. So I think I just have to be in the right place in my mind to expose myself to those stories. Yes, I said expose myself. <laughs> Stop <laughs> giggling like a girl. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, you're what not. I do? No, I'm not. <laughs> um, moving forward then, you still plan, even though you you know feel like other stories are being missed out, you're going to keep going to the Marvel movies, I imagine. If I, Because usually if I say, hey, if you want to go to a movie and it's one of the Marvel ones specifically, because you didn't go see Batman v Superman, and the I, Marvel ones are much more lighthearted. They yeah. seem to pick better casts that can do, and, and better writers or whatever, that tell a more enter- entertaining story from a comedy standpoint. A lot of the DC stuff, you know, the Batmans, the Supermans, or whatever, seem to be very, very serious. And I'm not a huge, super serious movie fan. I like to go and I like to laugh. And I like to have the little jokes here and there. I don't like super serious movies as as much as, you know, maybe you do. So, no, from that perspective, no, I'm not going to go see Batman versus Superman. Yeah. Because Ben Affleck, I think, <laughs> is going to make it terrible. And I'm judging that never having seen it. Yeah, because but... again, he was he was the best part of that movie, really. And Wonder Woman was the Wonder Woman in that movie was like would you go sure. see that? I don't know. Okay. I, but I... for you it's not a thing of whether or not it's a female-led film. Because Marvel's no. also going to have Captain Marvel coming up, which is a female lead versus seeing, you know, Black Widow take a complete and utter sidetrack and her only job now is to calm mm-hmm. down the Hulk kind of thing. Yeah, which is it's fine. I, I don't have a problem with female leads. In fact, I, I feel like there should be more female leads. I just wish that they had better female characters instead of, you know, because like, like you said, Black Widow would be a fantastic story on her own like the little exposure that we got in whatever the second avengers is basically a female jason Bourne kind of character that's really cool i would have loved to see that play out full story but she's a side character and they just kind of lock her in that side character box and the female i feel like a lot of the female characters that i know of personally not being a comic fan that i know of from the comic world are not female characters that I would like they almost seem like throwaway characters okay and again this is from someone who's never read them but to me the way I see other comic fans and other people portray them and talk about them they almost seem like permanent sidekicks even if they all have their own storyline like Wonder Woman great she's in that movie but it is not Batman versus Superman versus Wonder Woman it is Batman and Superman, here's a side character. Okay. So I feel like once people start bringing more female characters, good female characters played by strong leads, played by people who can act, who can really do that character justice. I mean, we have the feminist, like a second revival of the feminist movement right now, um, second, third, whatever. I feel like if you're not catering to that in some way, making these female characters very powerful without being complete and utter, you know, B words, you have, you have to cultivate that because a man super character superhero can be gruff and gritty and, you know, Batman's really kind of a jerk. Like he's really a jerk, 
but you still like it. He still ha- he, they are That's still its own podcast. <laughs> they are, but I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like they are still able to be like he punches people in the face and he gets you know he is a not a nice person, but he has this charming side, and so you forgive all of the terrible things that he does to these these people. Like they are bad, they bad are, people. They are people at the other end of his fist. Okay, like but they're. <laughs> But they, they deserve the punching, is that... Right. They are common criminals, though. They don't no. deserve to be, like, held out the window by their throats. I feel like that's a little extreme. <laughs> but these female characters are, are looked at and painted in such a way that you are either super nice, which makes you weak, or you are super strong, but that makes you unlikable. Okay. I feel... Like, that's sort of the problem with where we've gotten with female characters. And maybe I'm wrong, because like I said, I don't read it. But from an outside looking in, you know, you've explained to me that Marvel has no intention of having more female-led movies, superhero movies. Well, there's, like it, I said, there is, there's Captain Marvel, there's the one. But but not coming. like the Avengers. Like Black have, Widow's not getting her own. She's not getting her own And movie. there was the issue of the toys and... and exactly. Yeah. So they have no interest and... I think that's part of the problem is that is you should be able to tell all of these stories and give all of them the proper attention and the proper good writing that they deserve. If you really want to tell a good story, if you really want to hook the female audience, make characters that they can relate to and not just someone who's attracted to a sparkly vampire. Like that's not Yeah. That's not my kind of character. No. Don't make a blank slate that I have to fill in. Do your job and make a character that I like. Okay. Well, I hope that that becomes the case with Captain Marvel because if they're going to because it's the the Carol Danvers version of the character and if they're going to base it on the run that was written by a woman, Kelly Sue DeConnick, and it was a really strong book with a really strong female lead, and then the way Wonder Woman, I'll, yes, she was a bit role in that, but I think the reason she had that bit role was just to introduce her because she has the next solo movie coming. Okay. So I'm hoping that in that one it's going to be the case because the way they portrayed her was as being able to, like she's introduced in her civilian identity, so she's rubbing elbows with Bruce Wayne and everybody else, and then she goes out and totally kicks the crap out of this monster when Superman's not doing that great of a job, Wonder Woman is in there and she's having fun. She's smiling about it mm-hmm. while, you know, trading blows with this big guy. So they're trying to balance out that elegance versus power thing. So maybe I'll get you to go see it. Maybe I won't. Hopefully at the very least once Captain Marvel rolls around, which is going to be years. I don't know. But... She's going to be blonde with big boobs and do like the, the pose where you can see her butt and her boobs at the same time. Because <laughs> that's on every superhero cover. Uh, all the posters. Where yeah. there's a lady, it's like the spine does not move that way. <laughs> Well, well, we'll see. Like, I, I'm not going to say no because I don't know. I hope not. That's really not the character isn't meant to be looked at in that manner. Like, the uniform is very much like a flight suit kind of because she's a With pilot. With cutouts? Is it going to have cutouts? Uh, the I hope not. The Captain Marvel one doesn't. I mean, to be fair, if you go back into the history of the character, <laughs> like, her first costume was where her legs were bare and she had, like, a tummy cutout thing. It's her power center. Yeah. She needs to let the power And out. then as Miss Marvel, it was, you know, a one-piece swimsuit with, like, knee-high boots and long gloves and then, you know, no actual leggings, no pants kind of thing. But the current iteration is much more of a, here's a realistic, here's what you would actually wear. If you were flying around, with the exception of like a, a, a sash thing around the waist, which wouldn't really help while you, because she can fly while you fly, but it's much more of a realistic thing. And she's got kind of a mohawk thing going on. And we'll see. You're just giving me that look. You're like, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing. Is Thor in it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's talk about Thor. Or is that its own thing? Because here's the thing I think there's a, a lot more that you and I can talk about, though. I mean, because we can get into why somebody who doesn't read comic books thinks Batman is a jerk or specifically your love of Thor, which let's face it is not a love of Thor. It's, it's a love of, of Chris Hemsworth. No, it is not a love of Chris Hemsworth himself because I don't know him. Okay. But it is a love of that, how he portrays that character. Okay. It's, it's like how I like Ryan Reynolds. Mm -hmm. 
yes, he is a pretty body. Let's yeah. Let's just lay that out on the table, please. <laughs> just right here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. But it's mostly that he has he is written to have a humorous side to him. Right. And I find that attractive. Okay. And you know, in Thor, he is very chivalrous mm-hmm. in a big, dumb, lovable way. So he's got that chivalry, and the movie is very lighthearted and entertaining in a funny way. So there's humor in it. And so that all that tied together, because there's many, many people who have fantastic bodies, but they have to have those other aspects as well. And he just fits that role very, very well, with pulling all of those things together, which is what makes him attractive to me. Okay. And then the same as Ryan Reynolds in, because I did get you to watch Deadpool. Because I don't, yes. you didn't watch the last X Men movie with me. No, um, but you did watch Deadpool uh, once it came out. You didn't go to the theater to see it with me, but you watched right. Deadpool and you liked it as well. And I imagine that was basically the only reason I got you to see it was because it had Ryan Reynolds and you knew that he was in that movie as a, an entertaining character. Yeah, because I'm usually not. It, that one was a little more gory than normal comic book movies. I mean, there's much more yeah. blood splatter in there, um, which I'm not a fan of typically. But I enjoyed the humor enough to look past it. Kind of like Tucker and Dale versus Evil. I hate horror movies, even though it's not really a horror movie. And I hate gory movies. And it's totally a gory movie. But because it's so entertaining, I was able to look past that. So same with Deadpool. I was able to look past the stuff that I didn't like and focus on the things that I did. Okay. So the other question then that I would have, or I suppose the last question. Well, I have two more questions. So my second to last question then is, since Comic-Con is going on right now, while we are sitting here, as a non-comic fan, knowing what Comic-Con is and has become, where it is not just a bunch of boxes of comics for you to look through that vendors show up with, would you go to Comic-Con? Like, if I wasn't dragging you, as a non-comic fan, does that sound like an event that you would have fun going to? I think so. Because I think it'd be more along the lines of, like, the state fair, where I, I don't go because I like the attractions. I don't go because I want to see this big cow or this big pig who hates his life and yeah. someone feeds that pig bacon. That would that I, that might be illegal. I don't know who would, who would do that. And it was chocolate-covered bacon. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not necessarily into the... Just like I'm not into... They're talking about the new Twilight or they're talking about the new whatever movie. Yeah, yeah. I don't care. Right. So you but wouldn't go to panels. I would not go to panels, most likely. I mean, it would, there would have to be something like if Harry Potter was there. They did another Harry Potter thing and there's a Harry Potter Harry Potter panel. Cool. I, you know, maybe I'd go to that. But just the fact that you have to, like, get there two nights beforehand to stand in line to wait for maybe getting a seat. No. So for the most part, no, I I wouldn't go for the attractions, but I would totally go to people watch because you've showed me pictures and there's some really impressive costumes. And even though I may not recognize what that character is, I can still appreciate how much work you put into that costume and what that must have cost you as far as time and energy and resources. Even though I'm not into anime, some of the anime costumes that they put together because they're so over the top, you know, they have these massive props and huge hair that's just the style of the anime you know genre i can appreciate people who recreate that in real life and have to carry around this massive plastic sword all day that's got away who knows how much or like this giant you know hair piece that makes your hair six times as big as your body and how their neck has to support all of that. Like, sure. I can go to appreciate that kind of thing and see the vendors and see what's out there. But I feel like it would be like a one day go and see stuff and be like, that was really a cool experience. Get my picture taken with some of these crazy costume people. But I don't think I would necessarily go for anything else. But then again, I don't really know all of what there is at a comic convention. Okay, cool. Uh, well, last question then is we had talked previously about doing a series of podcasts specifically on the Marvel movies mm-hmm. where we would watch them together. And we did this with the the first Avengers. We never got farther than this. But we both sat down with notepads and I wrote down all of the Easter eggs or the little things I think you wouldn't notice or know that would keep you from fully appreciating the movie as a non-comic fan. And you wrote down questions, Mm -hmm. things that you didn't understand or that you figured might be 
something special or, or something you should have understood. Right. Is that still a thing that you want to do? And I'm totally yeah, doing this because there's people listening. I know. I know. I'm a, I'm a nice husband like that. But the idea of, I don't know, did you have fun? The thing that you'd come back and do again and wax philosophical about the comic book world or movies, Marvel have, movies? I don't have a whole lot of philosophical thoughts on the matter. <laughs> it's a bunch of pictures and words in a book. It's a glorified coloring book. Oh, you're oh. saying, you're, <laughs> that's, that's intentional. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no dessert for you. Oh, I'll go get it myself. It's fine. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate, I don't know. It Do seems weird, it? <laughs> right? It seems weird to, to like be properly thanking you. Like you're my wife. We're going to go get ice I'll, cream I'll or see something. I'll in two now. minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, so thank you wife for coming on. And I hope that you will come back at some time. I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be fun to find time to... Uh... Could you just hear my stomach growling on your on your mic? It's time to go get food. <laughs> yes, I could. Yes, I could. That's why, that's why I was staying. All right. Um, so that is it for our topic of the week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bow. Bop. Do. Do. Da. 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 All right, and that is it for this week. Big, big thank you to my beautiful wife who agreed to come on to the podcast. I hope we get to do a little more like that in the future. If you guys liked it, please let me know. You can let me know by giving me a star rating on iTunes. I prefer that, I guess, the podcast in general if you didn't like this particular episode. But, you know, wherever your heart takes you. Uh, a review is also very helpful for me. You can review me on any of the many podcasting platforms where you can find me. Um, or you can hit me up and talk to me directly on Twitter. I am at Noby, so at K-N-O-W-B-Y. Or you can email me at thecomicboxpodcast at gmail.com. I had one person, a buddy of mine, say that he had emailed me at that account and it never showed up. So I hope I'm saying it right. The Comic Box Podcast at gmail.com. And of course... I am part of the Geek. This is part of the geek to geek Podcast Network. So be sure to go to geek to geekcastnet where you will find all of the great podcasts in this network, and you can sign up for email notifications where we will let you know when each new podcast becomes available. So stay tuned for the big Comic-Con episode. I hope to get that done sooner rather than later, but it's going to depend on when I can nail down a co-host. But keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, as always... Send me your suggestions, and I will see you guys next week. Close in the comic box. Take care, everybody. Comic box. Help you with the sound effect. Fade to black. Bah, fade to black. <laughs> That's my movie trailer. <laughs> it is, but so so should I do the thing on top of it? You want me to be like no. ba da ba ba do ba? Because I don't think I can bah. keep a straight face. All right then. <laughs>